Uh, this talk is about type 2 diabetes, and what we're going to talk about is uh, it's called etiology and reversibility because this is kind of a whole different way that we approach uh, type 2 diabetes, which is different from the way we've approached it uh, before. And what are really, uh, you have to understand what really causes the type 2 diabetes in order to reverse the disease, and that's something we've never really talked about before, which is reversing the type 2 diabetes. And this is the uh, paper it comes from. It's called the Twin Cycles Hypothesis of Type 2 Diabetes. And it was published in Diabetes Care uh, by Dr. Taylor in the UK. And it's quite complicated, so we're going to take it through kind of very slowly. And the thing you have to understand about what causes the diabetes is that there's actually two uh, phases of type 2 diabetes. So this is taken. Uh, from the diagnosis. So if you go look back, here's the time of diagnosis, and if you go back in time, you can see that there's two distinct phases of diabetes. There's the slow rise in the blood sugars, and that really corresponds to the increase in insulin resistance that develops. But then, just before the diagnosis of diabetes, you actually get a very sudden spike up, and that actually reflects the beta cell dysfunction, which is the pancreas, all of a sudden can't produce quite enough of the uh, insulin and the blood sugars really spike up. And you have to understand what causes these two phases of uh, diabetes in order to really reverse it. So I'm going to start off with a case. So this is a case of Margaret. Um, we're going to have a chance to talk to her afterwards. And she had been diagnosed with diabetes for 27 years. And she started insulin about eight years ago, and she was really desperate by the time I had seen her. She had gained about 100 pounds uh, after she started the insulin, and she said some months it felt like she was putting on 10 pounds a month. And when I saw her in the office, she could barely drag herself in. She had no energy, she couldn't move. Um, yet she'd go to the, the, you know, her doctors and say, you know, I can't take this anymore. She tried to lose weight, but no matter what she ate and no matter what she did, the weight kept coming on and coming on and coming on. And that's an experience that we see with a lot of people who are on high doses of insulin. The insulin makes you gain a lot of weight. In order to keep her blood sugars controlled, she wound up on 120 units of insulin a day, which is a fairly high dose, um, as well as two grams of metformin uh, per day. So we talked to her about the, um, you know, how we're going to reverse the diabetes, and she started on the program, and about three weeks later, we had taken her off of all her insulin. We also took her off of her metformin, and her A1C, as you see, didn't shoot up. It went from 7% to 6.6%. Her blood sugars were averaging between 5 and 6 off of all the medications. And for all intents and purposes, her diabetes was reversed. She had lost 64 pounds in the process and 7 inches off of her waist. So it's been about 6, 8 months now, and her husband, uh, who's also here, uh, saw her doing so well, he started the program as well. <laughs> so he started on 80 units of insulin, and we're still working with him. He's down to about uh, 10 to 20, and really feeling very good. And what that demonstrates is that this is actually not a disease that's chronic and progressive. This is a disease that's completely reversible, but not only that, very quickly reversible. Because now, Margaret comes in and she's like, you know, you can't stop her. She has so much energy. Like, it was amazing how she was before uh, compared to how she is now. And these are really the two big lies of type 2 diabetes. This is the stuff that we tell patients, which is simply not true. So the two big lies, the first one is that diabetes is a chronic progressive disease. We're taught this in medical school. We teach this to our patients. We basically say, you know, you have type 2 diabetes. You'll have it for the rest of your life get used to it. But it's not true. It's actually not true in any sense, which means it's a big lie. The other big lie that we tell ourselves is that lowering the blood sugar is the primary goal of the therapy. So we focus almost exclusively on how we're going to lower this blood sugar, right? 
So if you need to take 200 units of insulin a day to keep your blood sugars down, well then by God that's what you're going to do because that's what you need to get better. But the truth is that that's not the actual disease. The disease is about high insulin resistance. So the therapy really has to be directed at insulin resistance and not the blood sugar. That was only the symptom. And the problem is that we've proven um, that we're going that the, we're going to take questions at. The so when we talk about the um, you know the, the the first myth, which is that it's a chronic progressive disease, that means it can't be cured. And this is actually not true. And you can easily show that type 2 diabetes is reversible. And they've done that, of course, with many different cases. So I'll present three cases, uh, all of which are real patients. And you'll see that this is not a chronic progressive disease at all. So you can take bariatric surgery. And there's many studies of bariatric surgery. I had a patient who was a long-standing diabetic who was morbidly obese. He underwent bariatric surgery, which is you know, also called stomach stapling, where they cut your stomach into the size of a walnut, so you really you just can't eat. He started off on 500 units of insulin a day, and really after a month of, after the surgery, he was on zero, so his diabetes was pretty much gone. And this is well known to happen, actually. We have multiple studies that show that this type of surgery cures diabetes. So this study, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, shows that when you look at intensive medical therapy, well, at the end of the day, at 12 months, they're really just on as much medication as they used to be. But if you do bariatric surgery, well, what happens is that very quickly they come off of all their diabetic medications. And there's two different types of surgery. There's the Rouen-Y bypass and the sleeve gastrectomy, both of which do very well. You can also do this thing called gastric banding, which is where you put a, like a belt around your stomach on the inside and tighten it so you can't eat. And they also do very well. So their weight comes down, but the blood glucose very quickly, over a matter of weeks, goes back down to normal, which means that they're reversing their diabetes. Another way to go is fasting. So uh, this is uh, another patient of mine who had diabetes for more than 10 years. And we started him on a regimen which included fasting. And after 50 pounds, he came off of all his insulin. And really, you know, a year and a half later, he's still off of all his insulin and he's doing very well. So again, here's another case of somebody who's lost a lot of weight and his diabetes went away. Well, that's very interesting because I thought there was no cure. I thought this was chronic and progressive. But clearly it's not. And even after so many years, and even as, uh, you know, on 500 units of insulin a day, these diseases are curable. And in fact, the fasting and the treatment of type 2 diabetes was mentioned almost 100 years ago. So this is a diabetologist by the name of Elliot Jocelyn, who's probably the most famous diabetologist in history. And he writes in the Canadian Medical Association Journal in August of 1916, so pretty close to 100 years ago, that temporary periods of undernutrition are helpful in the treatment of diabetes will probably be acknowledged by all after these two years of experience with fasting. Um, back then, of course, there was really no drug therapy. There was no insulin. There was no other thing. So fasting was one of the kind of well-recognized treatments. And he says, the practice observed by many clinicians of the old school who advantageously fasted their diabetics one day a week have given the cue to intermittent fasting. So these things are not things that were simply made up. These things were known almost for a hundred years. If you look during the war periods, so this is World War I and World War II, you have severe food rationing. So you're not talking about just not eating a little bit of sugar. You're not talking about not eating very much of anything at all, right? Uh, but when that happened, you can look at type 2 diabetes and type 2 diabetes mortality. And they go down quite substantially during the period of food rationing. So you can actually compare fasting and bariatric surgery and you can see that when you compare people who undergo bariatric surgery, this is the uh, surgery, to the diet alone, which is the fasting, you can see that not only do you get a little bit better weight loss, but you get better blood sugar control as well.
which is very interesting. That means they're almost equivalent. And the third case is somebody um, I met, a 27-year-old graduate student in physiology. She was diagnosed with uh, diabetes with a hemoglobin A1C of 10.4%, which is quite high. Um, her doctor immediately started her on three medications, uh, but she didn't want to take that. So she kind of dug through the internet and stuff, and she decided to put herself on a ketogenic diet, which is an extremely uh, low carbohydrate diet. So she lost some pounds. She lost about 20 pounds. And uh, when she went to her visit, she's, her hemoglobin A1C was 5.5%. In other words, her diabetes completely reversed with a ketogenic diet. So all these three cases are cases of cure. There's also cases of cure that you don't really hear about. For instance, if you have a diabetic and they start on you know, a lot of insulin, you never hear that, oh, I started all this insulin, now I'm great. I'm off all my insulin. That doesn't happen, right? It's the same with drugs, right? Metformin, sulfonylureas. Nobody says, oh, I started the sulfonylurea. Now I'm doing great. I stopped taking everything and my sugars are fine. In these cases, diabetes is not cured. In fact, it tends to get worse over time. When you treat people with insulin, with medications, they tend to get worse over time. So you can actually break these treatments into two groups, right? So there's one side which leads to a cure. There's the bariatric surgery, the fasting, and the very low carbohydrate diets. Those all lead to a cure for diabetes because you stop your medications, you do very well. And there's other ones, other treatments that don't lead to a cure, which is the insulin, the drugs, and the low-fat diets. And of course, the, you'll never guess, of course, which path we choose, right? We choose with all our treatments, with all our research, and our, all our goals, like published by the diabetes associations, to go this way, towards the path where we know that there's no cure. We know it because we've been doing it, and people aren't cured. So this is the problem. If you look at the American Diabetes Association, they have several facts. This fact, for most people, type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease. Well, that's actually a lie. It's not true. Because you have lots of people who are being reversed, who are being cured, right? And what they say here is that oral medications eventually may not be enough to keep blood glucose levels normal. Using insulin to get blood glucose levels to a healthy level is a good thing, not a bad thing, right? That's crazy, right? Because if you're on insulin, it means that your diabetes is more severe. So that's kind of like saying, oh, uh, sometimes cancer metastasizes into your liver. This is a good thing. That's not really a smart thing to say. If you're on insulin, that's much worse than if you were on nothing at all. So that's really, really stupid, right? There's no way that having severe disease is better than not having disease, right? And here they are telling you that, oh, it's good, it's good you're on insulin, right? And it gives people a sense of learned helplessness, right? This is the problem. They're telling you, you can't fix it. Don't even try. They're saying, you'll go blind, you'll go on dialysis, but get used to it. There's nothing you can do, right? That's shameful, really. And it's not just the American Diabetes Association. Here's Diabetes Australia. The same thing. Over time, most people will need insulin. It's important to note that this is just the natural progression of the disease. Here it is again. It's a chronic, progressive disease. There's nothing you can do about it. Don't even try. Forget diet. Forget everything else. Don't even try. So the second big lie of type 2 diabetes is that lowering blood sugar is the entire goal of the treatment of disease. So this is the way we think about it, right? So both type 1 and type 2 diabetes leads to high blood sugars and through various mechanisms like oxidative stress and advanced glycation end products, this leads to the complications of diabetes, right? That's how we kind of conceptualize it. So if you get rid of the high blood sugars, then you get rid of the complications of diabetes. And that's kind of what has driven our treatment of diabetes 
you know, for the last 50 years. There was a problem, though. It wasn't true. So about five years ago, there was four very well done, very large studies that showed that treating blood sugars makes no difference, right? So the first of these, which got a lot of press, was the ACCORD study, where they randomized over 10,000 patients, diabetics, to very tight control versus not so tight control. After three and a half years, the study was stopped because the patients who were tightly controlled weren't doing better, they were doing worse. So they had an increase in the risk of death, about, you know, 20% increased risk. Not only that, about 27.8% gained a lot of weight, over 10 kilograms, like 20 plus pounds, right? So this is the problem. It wasn't doing them any good. It was really, really bad. So that was quite revolutionary at the time, but three other studies came out right after that that showed exactly the same thing. The advanced study, which just recently came out with the uh, long-term follow-up, showed again that you can take people and really control their blood sugars really well, but it doesn't mean that they do any better, right? So it makes no difference. Well-controlled or not well-controlled, it just makes no difference. And there's uh, other studies that show that the low A1C is actually not very good for you at all. And there's a lot of studies uh, coming out from uh, various uh, places. So this is uh, Dr. Curry in The Lancet 2010, which looked at 20,000 patients. And they looked at people who went from kind of one pill to two pills or a pill plus insulin. And you can see, especially with the insulin, that, you know, really high blood sugars aren't that good for you. But neither are really low blood sugars, right? So if you have a hemoglobin A1C of like 6%, you think you're doing really good, but in fact, you're doing really bad because your risk of dying is about the same as if your A1C is 10 and a half, right? It's not good for you. It makes no difference. So this is the thing about type 2 diabetes is that we're kind of chasing the wrong thing. So you really have to understand what causes the diabetes in order to treat it. So what's the cause of di type 2 diabetes? Well, it's often the insulin resistance, right? But it's not the high blood sugars which causes it. But what do we treat? We treat the high blood sugars. So of course it's not going to make any difference. You're not treating the disease. So if you take an analogous situation, so suppose you have a bad infection, right? You have a big abscess somewhere. Well, the cause is the bacteria, so you need to treat the bacteria with antibiotics, right? What you don't do is you say, oh, I have a fever, so I'm going to treat the fever, because that's just symptomatic treatment, right? If you treat the infection, the fever goes away, but treating the fever makes no difference, right? It's the same as the high blood sugars. The high blood sugars is a result of the insulin resistance. So if you're not treating the insulin resistance, you're not going to get any better. You're going to get worse. And that's exactly what you see. So if you look at virtually all of your patients with type 2 diabetes, what happens is that they start with metformin, then they go on two drugs, and three drugs, and insulin, and more insulin, and more insulin. And what you see is that over the span of you know, 10 years, 20 years, whatever it is, you started with one medication and you wound up, like Margaret, on 120 units of insulin. So your diabetes is not better. It's worse. It's worse than it's ever been. In fact, at no point in the entire treatment was the diabetes actually getting better. And that's the experience not just of Margaret, but virtually 100% of conventionally treated patients. So if we think about how we're going to start moving now towards a cure for diabetes, we have to start with what causes the diabetes, right? What causes that insulin resistance and what causes the beta cell failure that comes. So the easiest thing to do, of course, is to start by looking at those um, situations where we know there's a cure already. So bariatric surgery, for instance, has been very well studied. So the question is, how does that bariatric surgery work, right? And 
there's a, several hypotheses. One of them is that it's the GI effect. That is, it's something to do with cutting out that stomach and rewiring that intestine that makes it work. But that doesn't make sense because there are several different types of surgery, including the band, where you don't even cut the stomach. And they all work equally well. So that doesn't really make sense. The second is that it's all due to the weight loss. And that doesn't really make sense either because it's not the weight. The diabetes goes away within two to three weeks. Those bariatric patients who are like 500 pounds, they can often take, you know, two years to lose all that weight. It's really hard to lose all that weight. But the diabetes goes away well before the weight goes away. And also, you could actually take out the subcutaneous fat with liposuction. And they've done this study where they basically vacuum out 10, 20 kilos of fat. It makes no difference to the diabetes. In the end, the only thing that makes a difference is the acute profound caloric reduction. So in both fasting and bariatric surgery, you have a period of time where you're eating almost nothing, right? And that's what seems to be beneficial. The counterpoint study was another study done um, in the UK by Dr. Taylor, where he looked at the twin defects. So those two defects we're talking about, which is the insulin resistance and the beta cell failure. And his hypothesis is that we get rid of that with acute negative energy balance alone. That is, just the restriction, severe restriction of calories causes a reversal of both defects. And what he showed was that if you put people on a very, very low calorie diet, their diabetes reverses. So this is the fasting uh, glucose. So you see very quickly, within seven days, these people go from you know, a sugar of nine to like 5.8, and it stays down, okay? So the sugar comes down first. The other thing that's very interesting is that the liver fat comes down very quickly. So here's the normal situation, and you can see that people with diabetes have a lot of fatty liver. And that is what comes down first. You get a 30% decrease in the liver fat. And over time, you also see a decrease in the pancreatic fat. And again, here's normal, so it starts out very high. So these people with fatty livers also have fatty pancreas. But over time, as you put them on these very low calorie diets, they steadily come down and down. And as that fatty pancreas kind of comes down and down, the beta cell starts to work again. So you can measure various, uh, uh, you know, like the maximum insulin response, how much insulin they're actually putting out, but they're putting out more, okay? So it was not that the beta cells were dead, it was just that they were blocked up with fat. There was a lot of fat there. So this is the twin cycles hypothesis is that it's all due to the fatty liver, which causes the fatty pancreas, right? So if you think about it, well, first of all, you know that there's a relationship between people with diabetes and people with fatty liver. But what's interesting is that the fatty liver long precedes the diagnosis of diabetes. So here's the West of Scotland coronary prevention study, about 6,500 patients. And they froze blood from them, so they're able to look back 18 months before the diagnosis of diabetes. So these are the people that di eventually di uh, got diabetes. And what you can see, this is the ALT, a measure of their liver function. What you can see is that those people that, have, that eventually diagnose, are eventually diagnosed with diabetes, they are showing fatty liver before the diagnosis. Those who don't get diabetes don't have that, right? And what you can show also is that as you reverse the hepatic fat, the insulin sensitivity goes back to normal. That is, here's another study of 12 weeks of a very, very low calorie diet. And what this is is a huge fatty liver. And at week 12, it's come down almost 30%. But it comes down first before a lot of the other weight comes down. So if you look at the hepatic fat compared to the weight, the hepatic fat, the liver fat, comes way down, 30%, for a relatively modest reduction in the weight. So all that weight elsewhere doesn't come down first because the fat in the liver is easily accessible. So when you are fasting or eating very, very few calories, the first place they're gonna take the fat out of is the liver. 
not from the subcutaneous tissue, for instance. And along with that, what you see is a restoration of the hepatic sens uh, insulin sensitivity. So here's the control. So they're normal. This is the normal situation. You can see that type 2 diabetes have very low insulin sensitivity. After you put them on these very low calorie diets, take out all that liver fat, they go back to normal. So reducing the liver fat seems to reduce, uh, seems to restore the insulin sensitivity, which is really the heart of type 2 diabetes. That's what it is. It's not high blood sugars. It's insulin sensitivity. So how do you get that fatty liver in the first place? That's the question, right? And the answer is, it's high insulin levels and excess carbohydrates. And if you think about it, this is what happens in the normal situation, okay? So insulin is a hormone that is released when you eat, okay? So you eat food, insulin goes up. That's normal. And what you do is you store some of that excess energy as sugar in the liver, so that's glycogen, or you store some of it as fat. So the, fat will, the, the, the liver will produce fat in a process called de novo lipogenesis, right? And that's a storage form of energy. When you don't eat or when you fast, the process happens in reverse. So your insulin level goes down, and then you start to pull out some of this liver fat, pull out some of this glycogen. That's a normal situation, okay? So what happens to these excess carbohydrates? Well, you can burn it, but if you're eating and your insulin is high, you're not going to burn it. So you really have two. You can send it elsewhere through VLDL, or you can store it in the liver, okay? So how do you get fatty liver? Well, it's really very simple, and you can do this to people. And this is a study they took people, and they gave them an extra 1,000 calories a day, but not just any old thing. They gave them Pepsi, fruit juice, and a bag of candy, okay? So basically sugar. So every day they gave them an extra 1,000 calories of sugar. And what happens is that they only gained 2% increase of weight, right? So their weight went up, but not very much. But there was a 27% increase, almost a 30% increase in liver de novo lipogenesis. So this is the new fat production from the liver and almost a 30% increase in the liver fat. So as you go from baseline, you get more liver fat. As you make them lose the weight again, they go back to normal. So it's all about the excess carbohydrates, excess insulin. And you, of course, you knew that already because this is how you make foie gras, right? You take the goose, you shove a tube down, and you force feed it high starch corn mash, right? That's like the candy that we gave those patients. And they all get fatty liver. Then you kill them and you eat their liver. So we know this already. This happens in other species. It happens in humans as well. And there's actually a very close correlation between the amount of insulin that you give a type 2 diabetic and how much liver fat they have because it's all about the insulin. So if you look at the insulin dose and you correlate it to the liver fat, there's about a 77% correlation between how much fatty liver they have and how much insulin they take. And if you look at type 1 diabetics, that's the exact opposite situation. Their insulin levels are extremely low. And what do you find? They have less fat in their liver than normal people. It's all about the insulin. So if you think about it, this is really what's happening. The liver is like a storage, like a balloon, right? So you eat food, insulin goes up, you store some sugar, as glycogen, you store some of it as fat, right? When it's down, it goes back. And this is the normal situation when you don't have a big fatty liver. But this is the situation when you have a big fatty liver. You're trying to shove more fat into this big fatty liver. And it's much harder, right? Because it's gonna take a lot more force to shove it in because there's a lot of resistance. Think about your suitcase, right? So if you fill up your suitcase, a couple of sweaters, it's fine, no problem. But then when it gets full, all of a sudden you're jumping on it, you know, you're trying to shove it down. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to shove all this fat into a huge fatty liver. That means it takes more force, more insulin, to move the same amount of fat in there. In other words, that's insulin resistance. If you are not, you know, jumping on your suitcase and you let up for a second, you don't take that insulin for a second, what happens? 
all of that sugar comes whooshing out. So that's what happens. So all these people who are on all this insulin, all it's doing is keeping it bottled up in the liver, right? And that's its normal situation. So this is where we can start to connect the dots of the twin cycles hypothesis. That is, what's happening in type 2 diabetes is that you have the excess carbohydrates, the high insulin, which is leading to the fatty liver. The fatty liver leads to insulin resistance, and the insulin resistance leads to higher insulin levels because you need more of that force to push it in. And this is a classic vicious cycle, right? The longer you go, the worse you get, right? Because this insulin is causing insulin to go up. But it's worse than that, actually, because there's two cycles that are going on here. So on the one hand, you got the insulin causing fatty liver. On the other hand, some of this fat goes into the pancreas. So now you get fatty pancreas, you get beta cell dysfunction, and you're not producing as much insulin and your sugars go up. And then you respond by trying to increase your insulin even more. When it fails, then you start giving people exogenous insulin. But here's the problem, of course, right? Insulin is at the heart of it. It's the high insulin that was the problem in the first place. This is what drives the entire cycle. Insulin drives the resistance, which causes it to go up itself. It's a vicious cycle. And this is a vicious cycle. You have two vicious cycles going on. In other words, insulin is what actually causes type 2 diabetes. So the question, of course, is that if it's causing it, insulin's not the solution. Insulin is the problem. So if you think about how we're going to move towards a cure for diabetes, you have to think this is the problem, right? Excess carbohydrates high insulin. That's what's causing the problem in the first place. So the cure, obviously, is to decrease insulin and decrease carbohydrates. So what's going to happen when you decrease insulin, decrease carbohydrates, is that now you're going to pull out all that fat from the liver, you're going to reduce your insulin resistance, and now you're driving the cycle backwards. In the longer term, you're going to start pulling fat from the pancreas, and then you're going to reverse that beta cell dysfunction. And as you reverse that beta cell dysfunction, your own body can start producing the normal amounts of insulin again. So if you reverse the two fundamental defects in type 2 diabetes, and that's going backwards. So what you can do is look back at our initial construct here. And you say, well, this is leading to worsening diabetes. We know that because we've been doing that for 25 years. We've been making these diabetics worse, right? How? Because we're increasing insulin. That's the entire problem. We're giving insulin. We're giving drugs that increase insulin. We're putting them on low-fat diets, which are high in carbohydrates, which stimulate insulin, right? And what happens is that if you look on the side of the cure, the whole point is to decrease the insulin. That's the only way you're going to get better because it was the insulin that was causing the problem in the first place. So you've got to remember that type 2 diabetes is a disease of too much insulin. Who thought it was a smart idea to give a disease where you have too much insulin more insulin. That's like giving an alcoholic more alcohol. Here, have another drink. It'll do those shakes some good. <laughs> yeah, okay, but the alcoholism is much worse. But that's what we're doing. We're giving people who have too much insulin more insulin. It don't make you better. It makes you worse. And that's the whole problem. This is really stupid. But this is what we're doing. All of us, that's what we're all doing, right? You go to guidelines, you go to Canadian Diabetes Association, that's what we're doing. We're making it worse. We're giving those alcohols another, you know, beer, alcoholics another beer. And when they start to get more shakes, we're like, take two beers, 
right? It's like, that didn't work in the first place. It's not going to work now, right? If they have too much insulin, what do we do? We just keep giving patients like Margaret more and more insulin. This is smart. And that's what we did for Margaret. We took her insulin down. It's all about lowering the insulin. And as you lower the insulin, you drive that cycle backwards. So the question then is, can we cure type 2 diabetes? Well, if you think about it for a second, it's incredible because if you don't have diabetes, you don't have to worry that they're going to get diabetic kidney disease. You don't have to worry that they're going to get blind from diabetic eye disease. They're not going to get their feet chopped off because of peripheral vascular disease. There's the cancers, there's the strokes, there's the MIs. And all of it is available to all of us for no cost, right? You're only talking about, there's no drugs, there's no expensive drugs that we're giving people. There's no fancy surgeries where we're going to cut people's stomachs out. And there's no cost. In fact, they'll save money because they're not buying food, right? So there's no cost to them. And the only thing it needs is the knowledge and the courage to challenge this conventional thought. That's all we need. Because if you think about diabetic nephropathy, for instance, and this is the, what we think about all the time, right? Diabetes causes the nephropathy. So what are we going to give people to take care of the nephropathy, right? You can use ACE inhibitors, ARBs, direct renin inhibitors, this, that. There's huge trials spending millions of dollars trying to find what are we going to give people to take care of this nephropathy. But the answer stares you right in the face anyway. If you're going to get rid of the nephropathy, all you got to do is get rid of the diabetes. It can be done. It can be done, you know, in Margaret's case, 27 years of um, diabetes, you can still get rid of it in a month, right? It's not going to take five years, 10 years. You can get rid of it in a month. And that's really what you have to understand that this is a disease that's curable in 90% plus of cases, right? We've proven that with our bariatric surgeries. You can take the worst, the fattest diabetics, the worst uh, diabetics, and you can still cure 90% of them. So all these simple cases, there's, there's no reason, and there's no reason why we can't get started right now. It's not a matter of funding. It's a matter of knowledge. That's all we need. And we actually have lots of cases. So here's a few more cases. So Richard, who I had a picture of, he had diabetic, diabetes for 11 years. He was on 56 units of insulin. Again, we took him down. He came right down off everything within six weeks. He lost 67 pounds, 16 inches, and you know, a year and a half later, he's still doing fine. He's still not taking insulin. Beverly, who we just saw, seen, broke the record at the time. She had diabetes for seven years, but she was on 210 units of insulin, right? And again, her story was the same. She was desperate. She was getting worse, and she knew it. She could feel herself getting worse, you know, and then she'd go to the doctor, and they're like, here, you know, go exercise, right? Go lose some weight. Well, the weight was all coming on because of the insulin, right? So it's not going to get off until you get off that insulin. What happened? Well, within three weeks, she was off of all her insulin. It's easy. It's not easy. It's simple. Her A1C went from 7.2 to 6.7%. She lost 30 pounds. I mean, she's relatively new, so we're still working with her to get rid of the rest of it. But it can be done, even in the worst diabetic cases. Michael had diabetes for 13 years, and he was on three medications, right? We started working with him. He took a little longer, but within 16 weeks, say, so about four months, he went from three medications to zero. He went from, his A1C went from 8.6% to 5.7%. In fact, he had so much energy, he felt so well, again, he started working out again, right? Now he looks really good. His weight loss actually doesn't look that impressive, but he actually recently, because he's been you know, lifting weights, has actually gone up quite a bit, but it's all lean weight. So it's very good. Again, another case of a patient completely reversed. 
This is one of my patients who I treated incorrectly for like 15 years. He was diabetic for 43 years. He was taking 75 uh, units of insulin a day. And again, he took a little longer because he had diabetes for a lot longer because again, he's been in that cycle of insulin resistance for a long time. But again, within half a year, he's on zero, right? On zero. He lost 37 pounds and his A1C went from 7% to 6.1%. So even though he's on less medications, his sugars are better. That means his diabetes is actually better, not his blood sugars, right? His diabetes, the actual real disease that we're trying to treat, that's actually better. Walter had diabetes for 30 years. He was on 70 units of insulin a day. By week 19, boom, he's off of everything. A1C, 5.5%. He doesn't have diabetes. He's on no medications. His A1C is 5.5%. He suffered with diabetes for 30 years. Unfortunately, he's also my patient. I treated him incorrectly for 20 years before that. <laughs> but he was also, we took him down. Like once we realized, we took him down in 20 weeks, four months. So is it worth it? Four months of hard work to reverse 30 years of diabetes? Sounds like a pretty good deal to me. He doesn't have to worry anymore that he's going to develop diabetic eye disease, diabetic kidney disease, because he doesn't have diabetes. He lost only about seven pounds. But again, it's not simply the weight. It's the fatty liver that's important. And Kirk, um, he actually was diabetic for 18 years. And we took him down from four medications to one. Uh, he had a long way to go. This fellow actually uh, lost uh, 117 pounds uh, over the last 18 months. So it's been steadily going down, even as his sugars have stayed stable. He actually was just about to go for bariatric surgery. He had met with the surgeon. He was scared, but he was going to go ahead with that. He told me, I said, whoa, hold on one second there, Kirk. Before you go ahead and do the surgery where they, you know, rewire your intestines, why don't you just give the, 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 the fasting a try? If fasting is what works, then do the fasting. Don't do the surgery so you can do the fasting. And it turns out it wasn't as hard as he imagined it was. And here he is, 117 pounds lighter, and feeling great. And he's another one again. He could barely walk. He could barely get in the door. Now he's moving around. He's uh, jumping around. So I'm going to uh, ask Margaret and um, uh, Ken to come up. So these are, uh, these, these are two patients of, um, of uh, Dr. Boutros, actually, who uh, referred him uh, to us. And uh, you know, the thing is that uh, you can have a seat over here. So what I wanted to do was, you know, just talk, to, have, have them share their experience with you. Because you might think, OK, well, this is great. It's going to work. But nobody's going to be able to do it, right? And that's actually not true. It's actually much easier than you might imagine it is. It's not easy, but it's doable. And I think that that's, that's really, what's, um, really what's important. So um, maybe I'll start with you, um, Margaret. So how did how were you before you before you came on? Why don't you just tell us a little bit Completely about that? Completely drained, not worth living. I had no reason to live. Yeah. And I felt bad all the time. Yeah. My eyesight, I couldn't look at my watch, I couldn't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't doing good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was really obvious because we, you know, she could really just barely get in the door. Like uh, she barely made it down to the office. And so we put her on a fairly, she was desperate, so we put her on a fairly intensive regimen of uh, fasting. And how did you find that? I was shocked. It was the easiest thing I've done in my life. The easiest. Like, first day went by, I thought, hey, I did it. And then it just kept continuing. I could have went, I think, the rest of my life without <laughs> Other than my family saying, you need to eat. Right. So I, then I went back to eating one day, fasting the next. And right. I'm finding this is working for me. Yeah, I exactly. think you're doing great. 21 quick. days. 21 days, yeah. She actually went three weeks. We actually um, had, we, we were seeing her actually weekly after that. And she said, she's feeling great. And I said, if you're feeling good, then just go ahead. Just keep going, right? We're monitoring the blood work. We're monitoring the sugars. We're keeping a close eye on you if you have no problems. And the thing that people don't understand is that the hunger actually disappears 
okay. usually okay. within a couple of days. Because what happens is that the body starts pulling out the fat, right? And the body is essentially just feeding itself through the fat. But because you're feeding yourself, you're not hungry, right? And that's what happened to her. And then finally... Exactly. Yes. Exactly. That's exactly right. And that's, that's what we do with these, with these type 2 diabetics. They have all this insulin resistance, and so their insulin goes up, and then we give them more, right? And then they get hungry, and then they go to the doctor, and the doctor says, well, you got to diet and exercise. It's like, well, the reason why I'm gaining weight is the insulin, buddy, right? And then the doctor says, oh, well, here, take more insulin and exercise. Well, that's not the problem. The problem was the insulin. She knew it, everybody knew it. The answer, obviously, is to get rid of the insulin. But that's how, what people don't understand. Right? But when, we, when she did it, exactly as, as, as Dr. Butro says, the hunger goes away. And the, the, the sugars go down, obviously, because if you're just burning off all that sugar, then the sugars are going to go down, and you're not going to need it. Yeah, you're not putting yeah. all those sweets in your body either. Yeah, and, and how are you in terms of your energy? Were you tired? Because a lot of people are worried about that. They say, oh, I can't exercise while I'm fasting. I'm going to be tired. I'm going to be tired all the time. How did you feel during I that? I thought I was going to not make it, and then all of a sudden, bang, I got energy that I never knew I had. Yeah. And I've worked my whole life on my feet, and so it's not like I've been lazy my whole life, but I had got to the point where I was lazy. I couldn't, right. I couldn't bend down. I had him pull up my slacks yeah. in the morning because they wouldn't go on me. You know, like I was being destroyed by my body, yeah. and my mind wouldn't convince me to do something about it. Yeah. Dr. Boutros was, would tell me go on a diet, and I agreed with him. It works, but it wouldn't stay off me. It yeah. would come right back. And when I went to him, he referred me to you. Yeah. And it's the best thing that's ever happened to me in my life. And I thank both of you oh, for this. Thank you. And um, so Ken, how did you feel? So Ken, um, Ken saw she was doing really well, and he decided that he would try as well. So how did you find the fasting? Well, I, I found uh, when they told me I had to go on the insulin and I had to stop jabbing myself, I said to her, okay, go ahead, jab me. And she said, no, no, you do that yourself. I said, oh, wow. <laughs> so uh, I watched her very closely and uh, a couple of times she was weak and that and I watched. And then when, she, when you told her and she said she's not on insulin anymore, I just uh, shut. Yeah. Know? So I said, I'm going to try it. and. Uh, I've lost about 25 pounds. Um, I take about 10 units uh, twice a day. I still take four metformin, but I've watched, I believe, 100%, and I believe in another couple of months I won't be taking insulin yeah. or metformin. And how did you feel, like you were telling me about your legs? And uh, <laughs> I wore a brace on this leg because I uh, arthritis and I couldn't walk, and the arthritis is in this knee, and I can't walk. And when I was at work, the guys will all look at me, and that, but I walk fine, and I feel great. Um, yeah. Just a whole new change of our lives. Was it, was it very difficult? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> I watched her, and I said, she said, okay, here, last two days on fasting, you know, my daughter phoned, how's dad doing? He's on his fourth day. He's gonna, when the fifth day or sixth day come up, she says, well, is that it? I said, no, I'm going to go to Saturday, make it eight days. You know? <laughs> uh, Breakfast, I, you got to realize, i got to have breakfast in the morning or I won't, I'll get a headache, migraine, sick. Uh, I don't even think of breakfast. Uh, I went to Rexford and had a nice breakfast with one of the guys retiring. Okay, but I don't crave breakfast yeah. or anything anymore. Um, we went to the Mandarin, that's fine. 
that really did it. Birch found it. They know the very, very well. They know the whole family very well. But uh, those, like tonight, I'm going to the football game. I'm going to have my sausage on a bun, you know. Uh, but uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. But uh, when I came in, I said, oh, help yourself. And I don't, I'm out of fasting. I can't even get that. And most likely I'll go a couple more days because I'm looking for something that's coming up for us and I want to make sure I enjoy it. So right. uh, it, it's fantastic. I, I just the whole idea of the incident, when I go into work and I see different people that I know and I found out for one of the kids I watched grow up and everything, Gal said he lost a, a toe and that, his big toe and that. And I say to myself, that doesn't happen. I drink Diet Coke, I drank Diet Coke seven or eight cans a day. Uh, when I watched her, I stopped. I haven't touched any good, coke good or diet coke whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. So is fasting water only? Um, Non-caloric drinks, basically. So, but no artificial sweeteners. There, those are chemicals that are pretty bad for you as well. So we usually uh, recommend water, tea, coffee, but no sugar, and like a bone broth, which is like you know you basically take bones and vegetables and boil them for like a long time. And you just take the soup, right? And then it's very nutritious, actually. There's a lot of nutrients and gelatin and stuff in there. And that's what you, that's what you do. Uh, and basically, if you're not taking any caloric fluids, you're basically forcing your body to burn off all that sugar. Because really, in the end, what happens is that your type 2 diabetes is there's too much sugar in the body. So you got to get it out. And this is the problem with insulin, right? Insulin doesn't get it out. Insulin doesn't get rid of the blood sugars. It simply takes that sugar that's in the blood and it shoves it back into your body, right? And that sugar goes everywhere. It goes into your eyes, it goes into your you know, uh, kidneys, and basically everything just starts to rot because the sugar is everywhere. Diabetes affects every single part of your body because you're taking it out of the blood and just shoving it somewhere else, which is like taking garbage and shoving it under the rug. You might say, look, I have no garbage, but then your whole house starts to smell, right? So all the while, which is really, you know, sometimes the most unfair part of things, is you, sometimes you see these patients who are super diligent. They're jabbing themselves four times a day. They're poking their fingers four times a day. They're recording it. And all the while, they're just getting worse and worse. They still go blind. They still go on their dialysis, but they didn't need to. They needed to go the other way. They're actually heading in completely the wrong direction. Um, and I'll, I'll just end on one, one more thing. So just to touch uh, quickly on a new class of medications, uh, which is dapagliflozin, which is um, one of the new SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, I'm actually quite excited about this entire class because different from any other current medications, you're actually getting rid of the sugar. So in this class, of course, you urinate out the sugar, but what's really important is what happens to the insulin. So you see this is uh, in combination therapy. But as you get rid of the sugar, the insulin levels go down, right? And what happens to the weight? The weight goes down. Why? Because, as Dr. Boutro said, it's all about the insulin, right? If you give insulin, you gain weight. If you take away insulin, the weight goes down. It turns out that obesity is also a disease of hyperinsulinemia. You know, it's not calories that drives obesity. It's insulin that drives obesity. Once you understand that, then you say, how am I going to lower insulin, right? Because the whole problem we had was that our entire focus was, how are you going to lower blood sugar? That was the wrong question. The question you should have had was, how are we going to lower insulin? And none of our current drugs do that. This is a start. And obviously, it's not going to be the entire answer. But the, the, the answer is how you lower insulin. So very low, very low carbohydrate diets do that. Um, fasting does that. And bariatric surgery does that. And you see that all of those eventually lead to the re reversal of diabetes. Right? And now, you know, you see it. I mean, it's undeniable, right? Yeah. Yeah.